Chapter 9 Four Flashbacks and a Setup I think a big mistake we make when looking at our current society is we think of it as a pinnacle. That is to say that all of history has been leading up to where we are now in our world. Certainly of more technology, and we've made strides that to our ancestors were unimaginable. But that doesn't mean we are the first, and it doesn't mean we are the best versions of ourselves, or even that our descendants will be. The equality of one society can drain away into oppression with a flip of a regime, and people can lose their rights just as quickly. Ideas can be forgotten or called heretical, and the world can revert into a state that would have been called barbaric a few decades before, while still being more advanced than it ever has been before. This happens when we stagnate, when we give up that desire to reach for the sky, and instead lower our arms with a shrug and say, Eh, good enough. We will lose the golden age we have fought for, and have to perform alchemy to bring about a new one from whatever ours is made of. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen a politician who can pass for an alchemist. Professor Freeman Xavier Graylin looked down at her hands. These were hands that had done hours of pipetting, had stroked cats, had carried coffee, had run along the silent glass walls of Atlantis. There were cuffs around these hands, sturdy metal cuffs that didn't bend. Her wrists were sore as hell. Next to her, the intern of her other self sat frozen, her face trying awfully to conceal her terror. She glanced at Graylin occasionally for support, and she gave back thin smiles, which was the most she could manage at the moment. Across from her was a man, she guessed from Central America? He didn't look particularly bothered by the situation. Gray lines dotted his black hair, and that signature way that screamed the man was at the strange meeting point between the wisdom of age and the physique of youth. The lines on his face showed he might be older than he looked, though. The van bumped, and they both rose from their seats as far as their bindings would allow only to crash back down. Graylin stifled a grimace. The man looked totally nonplussed. She had seen him before. She stared at him. He raised an eyebrow. You look surprised, he said. Songbird glanced over at them. She looked serious. I hadn't placed the name in the face before, Graylin replied. So, no introduction needed? I could afford one. Director Manuel Salazar. Norge Patenik. Doctor, designer, medical revolutionary. The woman with red hair scoffed. Shut up! No talking! One of the guards barked repetitively. It's all right, the redhead said. They're not getting out of this van. Graylin let the vehicle roll on a few more moments before she replied, staring at the red-headed woman. Who are you? Graylin asked the woman. The man snorted comically. She didn't look up. Don't tell me you don't know. Graylin shook her head, and despite the redhead not looking at her, she seemed to notice it. I'm Alice McLeod. You might have heard of me by the name people have given me, the Songbird of Liberation. Alice looked her in the eyes as she said, Songbird, narrowing her gaze into pinpricks of light that burned her retinas to meet. She turned her eyes away. I take it you're important, then. One of the guards laughed. The intern seemed to think Graylin was trying to be snarky. You can't be serious. I'm very serious. I don't know who you are. You're either a fantastic actor or a terrible one, and I can't decide which. Songbird idly checked her assault rifle. What's this revolution all about, anyways? Graylin asked, a little too innocently. I mean, 
she couldn't actually figure out how to repair the implications of that statement. I've been wondering about you. What exactly you are. You know I threw you out a window earlier today. Uh, yes, I, I was there. You were there twice. Not everyone can watch their own execution. So are you a clone? Or was the one I threw outside the window a clone? Manuel laughed. <laughs> Graylin Scythes would never make a clone of herself. She's got too much pride in her uniqueness. Graylin stared daggers at him for that, and he just laughed at her. Are the rest of the directors all dead? He asked Songbird. She didn't reply. It's not like we won't all find out later. <laughs> Are Graylin and I the last ones standing? If that is Graylin, then no. Ariadne Moore escaped to the rim. Manuel scowled at that. The rest are all dead, the intern said, her voice cracking, her eyes brimming with tears. We're still alive. We can pull through, Graylin tried to reassure her. Oh, I wouldn't count on that, Songbird replied, and the intern began weeping. Intern. Intern, Manuel yelled. Don't listen to her. She's not a god. Now what's your name? I'd rather they didn't know who my family was if I can help it. Fair enough, Minter, and I can respect that. You're all responsible for numerous atrocities or collaboration to them. We've noted them. I'm certainly somebody worth noting. Somehow Manuel came off as charming rather than self-involved. But Greenland wasn't sure how. Noted for your crimes, Alice added. So, how did you get here? Greylin asked. Here is such a broad term. Here, there, time, place. It's also transient. I'm sure it was a labor for all of us. Manuel's hands worked with a fury, dancing through the incision with precision. The nurses had their roles choreographed perfectly and the operating room was not so much full of blood but ballet, though there was certainly blood. Above him, the usual cadre of onlookers was observing the transplant, joined by a stranger they hadn't seen before. No one paid him much mind, though. Salazar finished joining the last piece of flesh and looked up at the nurses. Totally stable, Dr. Salazar. Salazar let out a pant. <sighs> it didn't feel like a challenge. That's good, sir. He shook his head as he exited the operating room and began to remove his garb to wash up. The other nurses could take the patient from here, so he and Nurse Maya exited. That boy's genetic abnormality should have been untreatably fatal, sir. But you surgically corrected it. That was a miracle. No one has your hands. Now that I've done it, we can run it into the machines. They'll figure it out. His hands are nothing. Irreplaceable. He splashed water on his face and looked up into the mirror. Such a young face for a doctor. Not ludicrously so, like they did in all the movies, but still younger than most. He dried his face and got ready to greet the well-wishers as he exited. There they were in a throng, waiting to congratulate him, get on his good side, invite him to their dinner parties. He didn't pay attention as he nodded, smiled, and responded by reflex. At the edge of the throng was a man, though. So nondescript his face was replaced when Manuel looked away by the idea of a man's face in his mind. He waited patiently for Manuel to finish with the others. He didn't try to cut in until the last one sauntered off, leaving the two of them alone in the hallway. You're certainly patient. Some things are better said carefully. He didn't rush his words, either. I'm a busy man. You understand. I won't waste 
words, then. I work for a man on the rim who wants you to perform an operation. Manuel shook his head. I can't be bought to leave my work on Earth for some backwoods titan. Excuse me. He began to move past the man. An operation you wouldn't be allowed to do on Earth. Something no one has ever done in the history of humanity. Something that is impossible. He stopped. Manuel turned. The nondescript man's face didn't seem to hold any expression he could pull ulterior motives out of. Go on. A complete skeletal transfer. In one operation. That is impossible. You can't keep a human being alive and perform that operation. Maybe over the course of years or multiple operations. With a completely metal skeleton. Manuel stared at Mr. Nondescript and broke down laughing. He laughed till the wall volunteered itself as his support to keep him from flopping over on the ground like a fish. <laughs> that... <laughs> that is impossible. You have me there. The man hadn't changed his impression. If you say so. However, we heard you were interested in the challenge. That sort of operation would be illegal anyway. I couldn't do it. Too risky. The insurance company would never allow it. They would know about it. No one would. But you would learn if it was possible. Salazar stood up again and met his gaze. And if the patients had died, then we would learn not to pursue this line of research any further. It was tempting. It was so very tempting. He had run out of work to do here that was meaningful. He had his own medical technology company, but they were unable to compete against the existing monopolies in any meaningful way. He did surgeries that there was no known program for the machines to do, and each time lessened the number of possible surgeries for a human to work at in the process as the machines learned from him. He was in all likelihood making the last significant gains in surgery any human would. Taking the final step was almost too much to resist. I am curious, ambiguous, senor. How did you learn about me? The man changed his expression for the first time. He smiled. She is already a fan of your products. Manuel stood in front of the door to the medical ward, running his hand along his smooth chin. The flight to Europa had been long but harmless, and Manuel was itching to begin. He had brought Maya with him, of course, but no one else. This was a sort of secret mission, medical espionage. He found it both funny and exhilarating to be going behind the backs of Earth's leadership. The unmemorable man opened the door and gestured for him to enter in. Inside was a teenage girl's room. The one decidedly of a girl who didn't leave it often. There were medical apparatuses all over the place, and a large rack of books, many of which were on seemingly advanced topics, especially anatomy, chemistry, and biology. A few on famous serial killers, some romance novels, some sci-fi novels about something called The Next Generation, with a man with a band over his eyes on the cover and some of those inspirational essay books. The wall had a few paintings and posters, mainly of flowers and pastoral landscapes, but also of a death metal band or two. From the bed, his patient looked up at him. Not an inch of her skin was visible, as she was wearing a soft, flexible suit from head to toe, her face an oval mask with a single eye on the right side. Manuel recognized the design well. It was his. A giant exclamation mark appeared on the girl's face, and he saw she was using it exactly as intended. 
The plush lung was supposed to be a way for people who had incurable, debilitating illnesses to live. The suit worked directly off signals from the brain and made communication and movement possible for people it had been impossible for. Micromotors in the joints aided movement. The suit kept any extra germs out and helped stabilize and treat any conditions of the patient within. For these patients, Manuel had figured that being trapped inside such a suit would be horrific as well as liberating, for even though it allowed patients with paralysis to walk thanks to its machinery, their expressions were muted by it as well. Thus he'd made the faceplate a screen that could instantly display images the patient wanted, helping them to express emotions and feelings without speaking. For those who had been in need of one, it was considered a miracle. Of course, another company had claimed copyright infringement, and he had to be very careful about how he sold them, even though they were not selling them. Usually the suits had to be gifts. But he was rich, so he didn't care. An image of a happy face appeared on the faceplate. Mr. Salazar, a voice said from the mask. She waved at him and began to get out of her bed, the motors clearly doing the work for her limbs. She made her way over to him, and he gladly embraced her. You must be Sarah. I've heard a lot about you. A heart appeared on her face. Probably not everything. The librarian always leaves out a lot of omissions. Omissions? She made her way back to the bed and sat down. Well, did he tell you why he wants me fixed up? Salazar followed her back to the bed. I was told he had a vested interest in you. That's a way of putting it. She reached over to her side of the table and pulled out a tablet, which she pulled a picture up on and handed it to Manuel. The picture was of a twelve-year-old girl with white hair and eyes so pale blue they could only mean she was blind wearing a bright blue flower print dress. She didn't seem to realize the picture was being taken. A pair of sunglasses were on the coffee table in front of her. She was seated on a couch next to two very burly men who'd clearly been jacked up on bio modifications. On the coffee table was a giant pile of money as well as a giant pile of what were clearly bags of drugs. He looked up at her, surprised to say the least. I started learning how to make drugs at a very young age to make a living as an orphan. By the time I was ten, I had cornered the market in my neighborhood. By the time I was twelve, I had my own gang. <laughs> she sighed. Naturally, that didn't work out well. I got pretty badly hurt. I would have died if the librarian hadn't taken me in. So you are an ambitious twelve-year-old. He thinks I'm special. I just did what I had to do to eat. Looks like you did a bit more than that. She held his gaze for a minute, or at least appeared to. She wasn't sure what to say to that. Well, anyways, I wasn't able to move at all until I got this suit. The librarian had to pay under the table to get a hold of it, but it was for me. He mouthed the words with her. A miracle. I read about your condition. The deterioration of your bones is pretty severe. She nodded. It's not just my bones anymore. Everything's basically turning to fatty tissue in me. I'd be dead right now if I wasn't encased. Manuel soured. He hadn't been told she deteriorated that much. He couldn't just do a skeletal transfer. The wheels in his brain began to turn, then spin, then they formed gyroscopes. I see. Sarah, how much are you attached to your current body? Sarah thought a moment. I really couldn't care less about it. What are you thinking? I'm thinking a skeletal transfer is small, he grinned. We could do a lot more for you. She seemed to perk up, the servos in her back straightening her spine. Do whatever you want, I'm in for it, he rose. And I'll begin planning. But I want to have electronic eyes. 
He frowned. You could have the finest biological eyes in the solar system. She shook her head. I was blind when I was born, and the first time I saw was when I was put in this suit. I don't want to learn to see again. Just give me the best sight you can. I don't care if it looks funny. One last question, Sarah. Who's on these books, the next generation ones? That's Jordy. He's blind, but he can see through an electronic band over his face. Manuel smiled. It was so important for kids to see people they thought of like themselves on book covers. He walked to the exit. And Sarah? I'd say we have ourselves an operation. The operation was difficult, to say the least. Everything had to go n pff, nearly. The skin had to be removed to be reattached later, as it was one of the few things worth saving. Her muscles and bones were basically mush, and most of her organs had failed at this point. He replaced all of them. Using a printer, he'd manufactured her new body parts, using an improved version of her genome, and carefully removed and reattached them to her system. He had to work carefully to assure compatibility. If the body rejected a new part, it would make the whole new system buggy. The new muscles were engineered like machines and could lift more than an Olympic athlete. Her skeleton was the strongest metal alloy he could find that wouldn't be toxic to her system. Her organs were better than any person's. Her brain and nervous system remained. It was in some ways all that was left of her. In the end, he threw out her skin too, after realizing that it just wasn't worth the effort to shape it over her new form, and had a machine print a new one around her. The surgery was exhausting and took more than one day, during which Sarah remained totally sedated. When it was done, Salazar sealed up the final incision, and stared at the person in front of him. She'd been trapped in a body, and would have died without him, and now he had made her a wholly new one, grown the organs, and stitched her together. Good God, Manuel said to Maya, she began to dress the unconscious girl in a hospital gown. I've broken the barrier down, Maya. If we can do this, we can save anyone. Anyone who can afford it, Maya said, without a hint of playfulness. Manuel clenched his fist. Sarah McClatchlan woke up to feel air on her skin. When was the last time she had felt that? She tried to recall, but it seemed too far away to nail down in any way. Her vision cut on, and she could see the ceiling raining light down on her from luminescent panels. Raising her hands in front of her, she saw skin and nails. Her arms felt strong. Sitting up, she felt down her body, reaching under the hospital gown to feel her shoulders, her back, her breasts, her stomach, her sides, her hips, her legs, her toes. She felt her face, her cheeks, her neck, and ears, and her new stubbly hair. She let out a shriek of joy and carefully moved her legs out of her bed. Her feet touched the tiles. They felt cold. What a wonderful sensation, cold. She had been perfectly temperature controlled in her suit. What a wonderful joy to be cold. She took a breath and got to her feet. She stood without any help, without motors pushing her. It was all her own body. She wanted to run, but she was still attached to the IV and didn't want to try to remove it herself. Pushing the IV with one hand across the room, she went to the mirror and stared at her own reflection. This was her face. Her own face. Hers forever. Her hair was just stubble, but it looked like it would be brown when it grew out. She thought she'd have the white hair she had as a child, but whatever, she wasn't complaining. But the best touch was her eyes, because she didn't have them. Instead, there was a half oval over her face, running from temple to temple over where her eyes would have been. Georgie LaForge, she smiled, and the first real surprise happened. Her teeth, 
like the rest of her bones, were a shiny metal alloy peeking out from behind her gums. She was shocked, and then shocked to see a look of shock on her new face. Then she grinned. I like it. Chrome teeth. There was a knock on the door, and she said with her own vocal cords, Come in. Manuel entered, with his nurse Maya and the nondescript man. She scooted over with the IV as fast as she could and embraced Manuel and Maya each in turn. You like the new digs? he said with a smirk. I love them! She became keenly aware she was smiling with those shiny teeth. Maybe she'd use that as a moniker. <laughs> we know that you'll be working for the librarian now, probably doing very illegal things, but... Try to remember what it was like to not have power. She nodded. I will. What will you do now? Manuel's face seemed to take on some sort of operatic tone. I'm going to remember what it was like to be powerless. The CEO of Algen Hoser Medical Systems rubbed his 400 credit haircut warily. These numbers aren't good. How on earth did this happen? Linda, a vice president, shook her head. Earth is exactly how it didn't. Nojpaten Inc. has been selling heavily off-world. It discounted prices, and we suspect has found a partner in the rim who can smuggle the goods to Earth and give them a cut of it. The CEO looked up. That's illegal! We can't prove anything. We'll buy them out! She shook her head. They're privately owned. We can't buy stock in them. Unfortunately, a new voice cut in. Your investors aren't so faithful as mine. A man in a gaudy black blazer with red and white stenciling on the breast walked into the room like he owned it, holding a black briefcase. Excuse me, you're not allowed in here. The man pulled up a chair to the CEO's desk and put his feet on it. Actually, I think you'll find I am. He reached into the briefcase and pulled out a pile of documents which he handed to the CEO, who looked over them bewildered. Sir, Linda said. It says we've been bought out? The majority shareholder is now someone named... Manuel Salazar? The interloper grinned and stretched back in the chair. Yes, he now owns it. Really? He owns you, and being that I am him, I own you. So you can call me sir. The man set the forms down. You insolent bastard! You can't just walk into my office and buy my company! Manuel looked around, wide-eyed. What? I... I can't? Why didn't anyone tell me? <sighs> well, I suppose then I can't terminate you immediately and cut your prices to something people here can actually afford. The CEO stood up, gritting his teeth. You can leave this room right now! No, you can. Do you want me to call security on you? This is my office! Manuel smiled and gently dusted his shoulder off. Maybe you gringos aren't used to being at the bottom of the food chain, but it's too late for you. You're part of Noj Inc. You need to accept it, or you can be devoured. Linda, get security. Get... Linda bit her lip. No, sir, I... I think it's time for you to leave. I'm sure Mr. Salazar has a lot to get done today. The former CEO's jaw dropped, and Manuel reached over and ate one of the candies on his desk. It's my pleasure, Director Sarkozy began. To welcome Mr. Salazar to the board of directors of Centro Systems. Nojpaten Inc. has successfully taken the world stage in medical technology in only a few short years. We're honored to bring him on board today. Manuel walked up to the front and shook Ebenezer Sarkozy's hand. The rest of the room applauded him and he smiled. A woman in a very stylish black dress really stuck out to him, though. He'd certainly heard of her, the elusive director, Ariadne Moore. 
she was smiling. But Salazar had seen a lot of people give him fake smiles before, and he knew this was a fake smile, meant to show it was a fake smile. He could tell they were going to get along great. The meeting with the directors was about what he expected, generic shadow government stuff. The cocktail party afterwards was the really interesting part. So, Ariadne said, walking up to him, putting her sunglasses on indoors. You made it onto the board of directors. I have to say, I'm surprised. I have to say I'm surprised you look so young. You didn't invent medicine, you know, you just undercut the people who did. That's capitalism for you. She gave a polite smile, and he was reminded of Sarah's perfect smile he had crafted for her. Is it capitalism? Well, let's not get hung up on petty things like the correct definitions of words. Oh, I wouldn't dare to be petty. But if this is capitalism, then I might be interested in supplying capital to you. Manuel raised an eyebrow. Really? Don't ask so surprised. I'm a businesswoman. I know when to invest. Manuel nodded. Then I have an idea. A project. I think you might be interested in. The car bumped again, and Songbird steadied herself against the side with her hand. Manuel looked like he was off somewhere else. Graylin seemed like she was trying to avoid looking at anyone. Songbird assumed the girl was overwhelmed, which added to the clone theory. Outside the car, a father put his arm out in front of his son, stopping him from walking any further towards the military caravan. A day ago, their world had been totally different. Maybe their home had been hit by a shell. Maybe they supported the revolution. Maybe they were against it, but they would have to live in a world with it either way now. Two people couldn't tear down the whole world, let alone a caravan. Songbird thought about those people as they kept driving. She'd never thought she'd win this, live in this new world. She thought she'd die clegging as she fired her last bullet into a centro soldier, but here she was alive. What would that mean for her? What happened to the man in the apartment? The girl who might have been Graylin said. I'm surprised you're curious. Of course I'm curious. I want to make sure he's okay. You... You have no right to ask that. He'll be taken care of and given the best treatment. You'd better. Him, the cat, and the intern here shouldn't be punished. I've spent my whole life protecting the innocent, unlike you. There was silence following that, and Manuel looked between them, like he was waiting for a commercial to end and a drama he liked to continue. The intern looked at the guards, hoping for one of them to be sympathetic towards her. How did you get here, then? Maybe Graylin asked. Those people call you the Songbird of Liberty. What does that mean? She turned her back to her. She looked uncomfortable in the cuffs, and she remembered the first time she'd been forced to wear them. She bit back, reflecting on it. It means I become a symbol of freedom against the oppressive systems on Earth. Manuel scoffed at her. Well, I've certainly heard his story, though I'm still annoyed he won't tell the end of it. He certainly talked himself up. That was the truth. Whether you believe me or not is your fault. I have to admit, I'm curious about your story now, too. Alice looked between them. I suppose we have to fill this drive somehow. Alice held out her hands to have the cuffs removed as her father finished signing the paperwork to get her released. How are you doing, Donovan? Oh, you know, it's hard to get work these days. The guard nodded solemnly. They'd certainly take you in the police force, regardless of your record. You know that isn't happening, Lisa. She nodded without meeting his gaze. Come on, Alice, let's go. She hugged her dad, and the two of them stepped out of the chilled police building into the summer rain. You can't keep doing this, Alice. We can't afford to have you locked up. 
longer. She nodded. I'll be okay, Dad. I haven't gotten caught doing anything too bad. He smiled. Well, your mother would be worried sick to know you were doing anything too bad, even if you weren't caught. <laughs> he held in a chuckle. The re this revolution, Dad. It needs everyone it can get. He didn't argue. But he didn't agree. Alice worked a boring job day in and day out, trying desperately to keep it for her family's sake. Her dad wasn't working anymore thanks to being found out as a radical element, and they needed the money more than anything. She walked home from work that day, her feet aching and sore from standing all day at the counter. Her shift didn't leave her much time to eat, but she didn't feel hungry even though she knew she hadn't taken in anywhere near the calories she was supposed to. She felt wobbly, but she didn't complain, and tried her best to look less tired than she really was. That was when it happened. Her day suddenly lost its monotony, lost its simplicity, and as she rocketed into an adrenaline-fueled awareness. There were two Centro officers dragging a pair of men down the street their faces against the concrete, scrambling with their hands to try to hold onto something in a desperate and futile attempt to not get arrested. One of the officers lowered a truncheon to one of the men's legs, and it was clear from the reaction that followed that the rod was electrified. Alice's face grew red. Things had been better than this, but they were just spiraling worse and worse. Her fist clenched. She couldn't turn away from this. She couldn't. She didn't know those men, but she knew why they were being arrested. The anti-Sodom law that had been passed with a wide margin. Rights were being whittled away right out from under every person living on this street, and they all started with the two gay men being dragged down the concrete like this was still 500 years ago. Alice walked towards the police slowly and made her way to their right. She didn't make eye contact. The police glanced at her but ignored her, and she got right beside one. Her bag shifted on her shoulder, and then she swung. The shoulder bag hit the guard right in the side, knocking him off balance, and Alice followed it with her whole torso, clugging hard to make sure the impact was as effective as possible. Your rib break. The other officer rushed her with his truncheon, but she ducked it and reached a hand up beneath his face mask and slid her fingers into the officer's stunned mouth, right between the cheek and the teeth, and then slid them out. The officer tilted his mask head to the side, started walking towards her, and then became wobbly, then fell over as the pill she'd slid into his mouth dissolved and took effect. Alice grabbed the man's truncheon and threatened the other officer with it, who held her hands up. She grabbed the officer's cuffs. She grabbed the officer's cuffs and bound both of them, then ran to the two men, trying to help them up. You need to get out of here. Thank you, the first man said from his bloody mouth. No time. You need to run. The police will be back here in force, and you and your partner need to run. One helped the other up and supported him with his arm. She watched them scamper down the alley. She stood alone in the center of the street, baton in hand. She tested the shock button. Well then, looks like prison it is. Didn't take long for vehicles to float down from the sky and land around her, men and women dropping out in their best SWAT gear. Ah, they really did care. Unidentified person. Please set the weapon down. Unidentified? I'm Alice McCloud. Would you like me to write it down for you? There was a brief silence. Alice McCloud, would you please set the weapon down? No. Viva la revolution! She was told later she shouldn't have been able to live through the number of tasers she was hit with. Alice expected to go to prison, but she didn't. Instead, she found herself released from custody like usual, with the guards being extra polite to her. I don't understand, she said to Lisa. I attacked corporate officers. That's a corporate offense. 
Lisa screwed her mouth up and then decided to tell her something. Someone paid for you to leave. The prison system is corporate, and if you want to pay your way out, you can. Well, yes, everyone knew that, but no one she knew had enough money to pay to get her out of prison. When she was taken to the lobby, there wasn't her dad waiting for her like usual, but a woman. Hello, Alice. I'm Miranda. The woman was Hispanic, probably mid-twenties, wearing a gray hoodie under a suit jacket and over a nice top, with slick black pants as well as oddly shaped sunglasses. The hoodie stood out like an elephant entered into a mouse beauty pageant. Miranda smiled at Lisa and tipped the jailer appropriately. Hello. This had to be some sort of corporate recruiting gig. You must have a lot of questions, but first off, no, this isn't some sort of corporate recruiting gig. She gestured for her to follow, and intrigued and confused, Alice followed her out the door. Miranda led them out of monitoring range of the police station before she spoke again. Well then, you made quite a mess of things, and while it would have been nice for you to have run your whole prison riot, I'm afraid things aren't going fast enough for my friends. Excuse me, who on earth are you? That's really none of your business. I'm afraid it is, and what do you mean prison riot? Miranda gave her a sly look. Do you really think you wouldn't have caused some sort of ruckus while you were in prison? I mean... Look, you're a troublemaker. That's why we've been keeping track of you. We want this planet's revolution to get underway quickly and cleanly, without any of that messy in-between. Alice nodded. So you're part of a revolutionary organization on Earth? Not on Earth, but I suppose revolutionary is the correct term-ish? The revolution is inevitable! As is your victory. I'm glad you have such confidence in the cause. I have a certainty in it. But regardless, I can enable you to make this war short. Shorter than anyone thinks it will be. It will still take... months, but not years. That's impossible. I'm an idealist, but Centro is so dug in. Miranda put a finger to Alice's lips. Shh. Think bigger. What if I told you I could get you the codes to all of Central's automated defense systems? You could shut them off, appropriate them, drop their drones from the sky, turn off the camera system that lines the entire city. That's impossible! Alice laughed. This was insane. Then explain that. Miranda pointed to the cameras on the street. They had all turned to face the sky. I don't... We're not being watched. We don't have to be. We have made the arrangements. Miranda held out an old-style paper business card. On one side was a symbol of half a sun and half a crescent moon merged together, the sun's rays somehow seeming the twins of the moon's horns. On the other side was a post office box number with a key code beneath it. And that box is everything you need to overthrow the planetary system. You can only access it once, and the codes will be the codes for that week. Don't blow your opportunity. Miranda took off her suit jacket and threw it at Alice, who caught it. It was a nice suit jacket. She turned and began to walk away, the back of the hoodie showing the progression of a sun into a moon through subtle metamorphosis. Why should I trust you? Miranda shrugged. I don't care if you trust me. Fight a decade-long war and decimate the planet. Your call. Miranda turned into an alley and Alice bolted after her. But she wasn't in the alley when she reached it. She looked down at the thin piece of cardboard. If this was real... She put on Miranda's suit jacket and slipped the card into her pocket. If this was real, it meant the world. It had taken a lot of persuading, a lot of yelling matches with different leaders over encrypted phone calls, but it was happening. 
or would be if this was real. She'd stake this all on trust in a stranger, but if it was real, it was an opportunity she could not pass up, a once-in-a-lifetime chance. If it wasn't real, then Miranda was right. Alice would fight that ten-year war. But if she could avoid that, turn the world over with minimal bloodshed. Alice inhaled and held her breath as she walked towards the post office boxes, and held it still as she tapped the code into it. Okay, be real. Be real. She reached inside and found a small gray box with that same half-moon, half-sun image on it. Pulling it out, she turned it over and over in her hands. There was a single hole in it, a standard computer connector port. It seemed pretty obvious how the thing had to work. Stuffing it inside her bag, she hurried outside. The box carried a heavy weight in her bag, and it drug her down. It was like she was carrying enough gold to buy the whole world from the hands of the corporate overlord she'd been fighting her whole life. She went back to her family's apartment and got ready to make the call. General Ewell Hammontree had fought against Mars. He had been there during the great disaster there that ended the rebellion in Mars's favor. Yule had been at Venus during the disaster of the failed base there and barely escaped with his life. But nothing prepared him for that Tuesday. Monday had been boring. He only remembered that he'd eaten a cheese sandwich during it, but Tuesday, oh, he'd never forget Tuesday. Pacing the room, things seemed to be going in order for the first few hours of the day, and then... Then he noticed something. Corporal Talzin? Bring up screen 51. The corporal did as ordered. He watched the footage. It was a street filled with people bustling through it. Corporal, bring up Monday's footage, same time. The corporal did. They were the same. It was the same footage. The general yowled and ran to the alert station. He jammed his finger at the touchscreen, but nothing happened. What is going on? I've lost control of my station, sir, someone yelled, and then more voices joined in in a chorus of it. We can't lose London. Someone get in touch with the drone setter. Then he heard several shots, and turned to see a woman flanked by a swarm of raggedy rebel soldiers walking in his command center, holding a battle rifle. I'm afraid it's too late for you. You know, your people outside have been yelling into their communicators for half an hour while we fought our way in. You might want to put your weapons down on the floor. Several people did. Several tried to draw theirs. The latter were shot with cunning efficiency. Who do you think you are? Alice MacLeod of the World Revolutionary Council. Who are you? General Yule Hammontree. Now, young lady, you'll stand down. The people are singing for liberty, General. Now get out of my way. He puffed his chest out and straightened his tie. I'd rather die. She shot him in the leg. Let's compromise. She stepped over him and took out the box from her bag. They'd used it to break into the base, and it had gone gloriously, but now... Now was the real test. She plugged into the console, and the screens in the room all lit up with that same sun-moon symbol. Hello, my name is Alistair. The Brox crooned through the speakers. Could you please supply me with your name and username? Alice MacLeod, she said, kicking the general's hand away from the holstered gun he was reaching for and grabbing it herself. Username. She looked around the room. She used to sing in the tavern. Her dad's friends met up in. They said her voice was as pretty as a nightingale, a wonderful songbird. Well, it was her friend Jack who called her that first. She smiled at him. He was nervously holding a gun towards the crouched room of technicians. Call me Songbird. The screens displayed a black and white image of a songbird, and Alistair spoke again. All right, then. Songbird. I'm at your command. She smiled. They always said I'd set the world on fire. Let's get this started. From one bird to another. Let's take theirs out of the sky. For hundreds of years, the world had been monitored by a linked system of satellites and drones. 
For hundreds of years, everyone knew that everything they said was being recorded. And then, on a Tuesday, the drones fell from the sky. Next, the cities began to fall, and the people at the top, who had feasted on the fruits of those beneath them, came tumbling down, as it turned out, often fairly literally, as Alice took a predilection towards executing CEOs by hanging them out of windows. The prison labor camps were the next thing she freed the people there being worked to death for having wrong ideas or wrong lifestyles cheered her as she liberated each camp, their bodies thin and bruised, their cries weak. She got out of her vehicle and hugged them, touched their hands, talked to them. Soon they began to call her the songbird, and it stuck. City by city fell, and it became clear the world would fall far quicker than the ten-year war they had anticipated. Then she went to Mexico City. Jack was by her side, of course. He always was, as the hovering craft flew towards the city. So, Alice, I was thinking, when this is over, there will be a lot of clean-up work. We'll have to be really on top of the leftover central elements. No, Alice, I mean, I was thinking about us. She checked her rifle. It was in perfect order. About us what? Alice, you know how I feel about you. She sighed. Jack, I'm not interested in you. We've been through this. She counted a moment in her head. Nine times, actually. Well, maybe ten, not sure if that counted. Okay, but when the war is over... Jack, I'm not interested in you. I don't want romance. I'm an aromantic asexual. You know what that means, right? Yeah, but... Thought that might change when the war is over. Alice scooted away from him a bit. I'm not who you want me to be, Jack. I'm sorry. The hovercraft landed, and they stormed off. She raised her rifle and tried to get back into the mindset she needed. The first center soldier popped up, and she was fast on the trigger, capping him right in the forehead before he could level his gun. The gunfire moved into full force, and she lost track of herself. She shot through the smoke, diving over barricades and obstacles, slamming her rifle butt into the jaws of enemies who slipped through the smoke, and leveling again quickly to take shots at those far away. She was made for this, and she was merciless, not out of anger, but out of precision. Her violence was exact and total. Her heart raced as she ran through and shot a soldier trying to close a side door into the base before he could, slipping through right after him. She had forgotten that there was still battle behind her. She stormed the hallway. Not that there were many people in it. She shot those who opposed her and tied up those who surrendered. The rest of her troops made it into the building, and she stood in the cleared space, leaving the rebels who saw her with a bold and ludicrous impression she could have done this herself. Is the outside secure? Yes, ma'am, said a burly woman with vitiligo. Call me Alice, and good. What's your name, soldier? Chantel, ma'am. Alice nodded. Let's move out, then. The base was nearly empty. Eerily. She'd expected more resistance. They walked through the darkened barracks and empty mess halls till they reached a thick, sealed door. Alice looked at Trevon, the resident door opener, who went to work on the lock with quick skill and the aperture opened to reveal a room filled with several people in lab coats trying desperately to pry open a door. We need to get the backup hard drive wiped. Open it, one yelled. The bomb will take care of it. Let's just get out of here, another yelled back. Can't you tell it's meant to survive the explosion? Open it, or... Or what? Alice said, striding into the room. The scientists huddled together. Where is the bomb? It was an order, and the people knew it. It's, uh, it, 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 in the, in the main factory floor, one of them said, pointing towards another door. Alice strode confidently towards it, opened the door, and walked through. There was a moment where no one could see Alice, and the room was silent. Then she walked back into the room her rifle hanging loosely from her hand, then clattering to the floor. She shook, gently, her eyes wide and full of lines of red. 
She nearly stumbled over and put her arm against the wall. Alice, what? Jack began, but she interrupted him. She threw up, keeling over to her knees, still shaking. Jack hurried over and put his hand on her. What's wrong? She looked up, her eyes boiling over, tears running down her face, and her hand finding the handle of the gun properly again. You... You... You did that! She looked at the scientists. I... How could you? I... She began gagging again and threw up a second time. She staggered up and pointed the gun at them. Hold up, Alice. Don't do anything hasty. No, no, this isn't hasty. This... Jack, you don't want to see what's in there. I promise you. There's nothing that could provoke you killing these people. She looked at him like she had seen hell, and he shook his head and walked towards the door. Jack... Don't go in there. I promise you, you can't unsee that. Don't! He ignored her. He walked in. All they heard for the next two minutes was him screaming. He walked back in, even more shaken than Alice had been. He looked at her. Do it, he muttered. Do it! We, 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 were, we were just following Greylandside's orders, one of them yelled. Please! Just following orders? Songbird's voice was loud enough to echo through the building. Just following orders! There is no order that could justify that! There were seven scientists in the room. Alice's hands shook so much. She used ten bullets, but the effect was the same. Standing over their corpses, she motioned for Trevon to go in and disarm the bomb. I'm sorry. You shouldn't have to see that. He nodded. He needed her help in the end to do it himself. He was shaking so much. But the bomb was disarmed. As they flew back, Songbird stared at the giant complex. The complex she never wanted to see again. She only had one thought that she said out loud during the trip back. I'm going to kill Graylin Scythes. No one argued it. Graylin stared at Alice. Her hands were shaking. Her jaw trembled. She fingered the rather banged-up cat pin on her lapel, but couldn't get a grip on it. What did you see in there? You know. I don't know. You know! Alice yelled. You can't tell me. If you're really Graylin Scythes, you don't know what was behind that door. And the only reason you're not dead yet is we don't know. And the WRC is starting to cool down enough they want trials instead of battlefield executions. That you and your friend made a strong case for your survival. Arch? She asked, full of hope. Yes, you can thank him later. If you're a brainwashed victim and all this, some poor confused clown, or what was it he said in that elaborate story of his? What did he say you were? Manuel asked. The truth, I hope. He said you were from an alternate reality. Balderdash, of course. Ma'am, should you really be talking so much with the prisoners? A woman with vitiligo skin said. It's all right, Chantel, I have leeway on this matter. The WRC is just as curious as we are. Well, if we're telling our stories, what about you, intern? She shook her head. I don't want to say anything I shouldn't. Give family in trouble. Of course. How about you, Scythes? What kind of a last name is Scythes, anyway? It sounds made up. It's my real last name. So then, Graylin, Songbird interjected, how did you get here? It's a long story. It's still a long ride. We have time. Start from the beginning. The beginning? 
She knew where the story really began, but she didn't want to start there. She thought she'd begin somewhere easier to talk about, when, but when she started talking, things spilled out she hadn't intended, and she kept talking. As beginnings go, it wasn't one she would write down. Graylin shifted her hand to swirl the beaker, holding it up to her eyes. It wasn't exactly reacting like it was supposed to, which was curious. The lack of reaction was just as interesting as getting one's, uh, Graylin... Didn't you say you had to be somewhere at seven? She turned to look at the person speaking. It was Professor Hansen. Uh, yes, I've got a date with Ashlyn, then. You probably want to get ready to go as a quarter till. Shit, she was right. And she'd be late no matter what at this point. <laughs> she jotted down the lack of reaction, cleaned up, took off her lab coat, and hustled out the door to the bus stop checking the time on her phone over and over. The bus arrived a tiny bit late, and she bustled onto it, finding the perfect seat on it. The city rushed by the window, and she closed her eyes as the bus jostled her against the window. Graylin ran to the diner, fifteen minutes late, looking past the greeter for Ashlyn, who was sitting alone at a table for two, looking boredly at her phone. Graylin pointed to the table, and the greeter let her through. She sat down, and... Hoped she looked decent. You're late, Ashlyn said, scrolling through her phone. You're late, Ashlyn said, scrolling through her phone. Sorry, I got cut up at work. I was testing reactions to a compound they've been developing at the lab for the team there. Ashlyn put the phone in her pocket and gave Graylin a look that said, Shut up. Look, Graylin, we need to talk. Okay, well, I'm here, so go ahead. We can't keep doing this. Graylin was silent for a moment. If you mean me being late, I can set an alarm next time, or... No, Graylin. That's just a symptom. You're forgetting to take enough time to set an alarm to remember our dates as a symptom. Honestly, why are you even in this relationship? They stared at each other for a moment in silence. Graylin rubbed her fingers together under the table. The waiter came by, and each of them ordered something, which felt more like a commitment than was prudent with how things were going. Of course I want to be in a relationship with you. I dumped Peter so we could date. Yes, and when you dumped Peter, he told me to watch out for you because you would act like you cared about people more than you did so they wouldn't leave you. You're fifteen, Graylin. You don't need to hold on to this like it's going to be forever if you don't want it to be. I'm seventeen, and I don't have to put up with this. Also, you dodged the why question. Graylin squirmed in her seat. She felt her face turning red and her hands becoming ice. We have so much planned out together. Getting an apartment together when you go back to London. Supporting each other. Ashlyn pursed her lips her shoulder-length brown hair swaying back and forth as she leaned in. She always wore such nice outfits, summer dresses or skirts and sweaters. A few times suits, but the way she preferred skirts and dresses to pants was one of the things that had drawn them together in the first place. We do have a lot planned out, and that's why this is important. Because I'm not going through with a plan with someone who's only half involved in it. You're always late... You're nearly as always distracted when we're not so loud, Graylin said, glancing around as though anyone had been listening. Okay, quieter. It's like you're doing calculations in your head. But I am doing calculations in my head. There's nothing wrong with that. Did you ever think I might want more than you're giving me back? You always hold part of yourself back. You listen. But you don't talk about yourself, just your work. And who spends all their time at a lab at fifteen? I mean, I started dating you because you seemed a lot more mature than you are. You're two grades up in school and doing lab work at fifteen. That's impressive. It really is. And I thought there would be more to you than that, but what else is there outside of it? It's like you were never a child. I love music, Graylin said, her voice cracking. And cats... There was a pause. 
and you. Great. Three things. I won't be here forever, and I'm going back to London when the summer starts. I keep asking myself, will I miss you? Will you miss me? Or is the fact that you can move in with me just convenient for you? Graylin's stomach churned. Well, it is convenient, but... She struggled to find the words. I... Ashlyn looked at her sadly. Their food came. We may as well enjoy one last meal together. Dig in. Last. So you're breaking up with me. That's it? Graylin's face drained of all its color. Her muscles retreated, and she was only alive by the sign of her breath. I... Look, I didn't want it to go this way, but it has to. I can't keep doing this, Graylin. You're not my only option, you know. How much does it hurt? Graylin asked. Excuse me. I need to know how much it hurts you. Right now. Graylin looked over at her face. It was strangely impassive. To break up with you? Yes. Why would you ask me that? Graylin shrugged. I want to know. It hurts a lot, for the record. Graylin nodded. The gears were turning in Grayland's head. I'm very disappointed this didn't work out. I'll have to take other measures. Other measures. The plan has to change. The plan. That's what I was to you. A plan. You just needed me around for some benefit. That's why we keep other people around. For their benefits. That's a sort of relationship is... No, we don't. Not normal people. Normal people think about how they care about other people, their feelings. I do care about you. I did think about your feelings. I asked how much this hurt you. Like I'm an experiment. I didn't think when I'd break up with you that you'd find a way to break my heart even more. Greelin shrugged. You can never achieve anything if you aren't willing to cut out your own heart can never advance unless you sacrifice what matters to you. You cut me out of your chest first. I don't benefit in you anymore, and I can respect your calculation. You sometimes barely talk like you're human. I didn't calculate leaving you. Graylin looked down at her plate. I'm good at calculation. I notice things. I just didn't want to believe them, but that's life cutting things out. I should have expected it. I've been trying. I really have. You've always made me feel so free, but I can see I had things scrambled. Still, I notice things. So, is there someone else? Ashlyn looked awkward. She couldn't meet her gaze and stared off into another table's candle flame. Oh, Graylin said. Graylin had met Ashlyn when she had gotten bumped up another grade at the start of the school year. She was a foreign exchange student from London, or maybe Blackpool. She said both of them at various points, and Graylin was instantly attracted to her. She had a sort of wide, round face that was both beautiful and adorable. She was always making funny quips. She'd mastered Russian in a flash, and was already making terrible puns. Graylin and her began talking about each other's clothes, a topic Graylin usually couldn't care less about, but which suddenly took in a whole new dimension with her. Graylin definitely thought she was hot, but there wasn't a romantic spark. She'd only rarely felt that for people she'd known for a very long time, like Peter, but Ashlyn was so much more interesting than Peter, whose idea of a fun date was going somewhere and walking around for two hours. She decided it didn't matter. Maybe if she waited, the spark would come. She waited. And waited. And it never came. It occurred to her around this time that she could be attracted to anyone if they had enough charm or looks, so she was definitely pansexual, but she had to be demi-romantic, only attracted to people she developed an emotional connection to. She dumped Peter for Ashlyn, and they seemed mostly happy together, but Ashlyn was right. She couldn't open up to her. She kept trying, but... She couldn't. Didn't mean she didn't care. She wasn't sure what it meant. 
So, who is it? I didn't want you to find out this way. All that stuff about what I've been doing. You're telling me you found someone else. I may be a terrible girlfriend, but at least I'm a loyal one. Who is it? Just hold your hand still. I'm trying. Graylin looked down as the machine began to carefully treat her nails. Ashlyn laughed from the chair next to the other machine. It's just a manicure. You said you were cool with getting one when we were getting coffee. It seemed like a good idea then. The needles and lasers and other devices went to work layering color and detail onto her nails when a holographic pop-up appeared. Oh, not that. Use your left hand. Not the one being worked on right now to close it. Graylin read the hollow display. It says I can put a hard drive into the paint on my nail? Yeah, it's a cheap trick. Handy, I guess. Handy, yeah? Graylin rolled her eyes. Right, well, nothing subdermal or permanent, right? Ashlyn shook her head. Graylin tapped yes, and the machine got right back to work. When they had finished, their nails were short, bold, and beautiful, layered in carefully chosen colors and shades. Ooh, yours are very nice. Got an ocean pattern. I like the ocean, she said plainly. Clearly, look at mine. Graylin held her hand gently and examined the stylized, blinking eyes on her fingernails. They move. That shouldn't surprise you. It's not that fancy. Graylin threaded her fingers through her own and smiled. I like them. She smiled back and, running her fingers through Graylin's hair, kissed her. They kissed deeper, and several adults walked past, rolling their eyes, as they are wont to do with teenagers. Graylin felt Ashlyn working at the back of her head, and then her hair dropping down from a ponytail. She pulled back. What was that about? Just a subtle message to let your hair down once in a while. She blushed and leaned back in for another kiss. Marilyn. Marilyn, Graylin stood up. You're dating another Lynn? Seriously? Lynn and Lynn, Graylin held up the paper she'd drawn the words on sloppily. Like a duo. Well, definitely a duo, but I think we can do better than that for a couple name. Ashlyn gestured for the pad of paper, and Graylin handed it to her. She turned to a new page and scooted over on the bed so Graylin could see it. Graylin glanced back over at her homework. Lynn squared, Ashlyn said, holding up the paper, which of course had Lynn to the power of two written on it. Graylin grinned, picking up her homework. It's perfect. We should make t-shirts. Graylin lowered her homework slightly. My goodness, we should. That was our thing, Lynn, squared. She sat down, collecting herself. You're giving her one of the spare shirts, aren't you? No, no, I wouldn't do that. You're lying. The waiter refilled their glasses. Okay, maybe I am, but... Graylin slumped down, took off her glasses, and began rubbing her eyes. Oh, no. No, 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 no. I've really hurt you. I'm sorry. I, I really didn't mean... Ashlyn reached out a hand nervously. It's just... I... You couldn't have waited three days. What's... What's in three days? My birthday. Ashlyn looked paralyzed. Oh. Don't. Don't worry about it, Graylin said calmly. It was clearly my mistake. Graylin pulled the cheap ring on the necklace from over her head and set it on the table. I'm sorry I wasn't good enough for you. I hope she likes this. Graylin! She got up, paid at the counter, and went out the door. Graylin got back into the house from work. She'd been doing the usual lab work, pipetting, filling out other people's paperwork, cleaning the equipment. She'd texted a few people, but no one had responded. 
that was okay. She'd find a way to make today work. As she stepped into the living room, her mother was there, wearing a loose-fitting blouse and beige slacks. And where have you been? It wasn't really said like a question, so Graylin didn't answer. She just tried to walk past. An arm reached out in front of her. No, not today. You're going to stay here and talk to me. She was tired of talks this week. Could I please just go to my room, Mom? No, I've had enough of your room. I went in there today. You went into my room. Graylin's eyes went wide. She pulled her phone out of her bag, tapped the screen carefully, and set it on the mantel. Yes, I went into the room I gave you, and guess what I found? What did you find? Her mother reached down to the table and picked up several internship flyers. What did I find? I found these flyers for internships outside of Moscow. They weren't there when I checked your room yesterday. I can go where I want. You're just a teenager. What do you know about anything? Are you going to go off and explore the world like some useless hippie? You are staying right here, and you're going to be useful. You've never been as driven as your sister, or as smart as your brother, but I'm not going to let you be a total loss. Graylin gritted her teeth. You mean like Xandra? Maybe I'd like to be Xandra. Her mother glared at her, and Graylin's voice caught in her throat. You're not going anywhere, and that's final. You're staying here, and if you try to leave, I'm calling the police on you. And you're not seeing that... girlfriend of yours anymore. Ah, yes, you thought you could keep that from me, too. Hm. Many may have accepted that immoral bullshit centuries ago, but us scythes are better than that. Well, you got your wish. She dumped me three days ago, Graylin muttered. Good, and then you won't be mad I burned everything with her name on it. Graylin gasped. She'd still held the Lynn Squared shirt while she slept this week. Not that she'd ever let Ashlyn know that. You burned my things? Yes, and I'm going to be keeping a much tighter leash on you, you little slut. I'll be picking you up when you finish your shifts now so you don't get up to anything. Understood? Yes. Yes? Yes, ma'am. Good. I'm glad we understand each other. I thought you might amount to something, Graylin. She shook her head. I really did. But you're just as much a disappointment as Xandra. Maybe we should set your sights lower. I don't think you can get into the programs I was expecting you to. You put such a burden on me. I've worked so hard for you. How could you hurt me like this? My own daughter. I bet Andre wouldn't have put us through this. It probably would have been better if you'd done a better job when you were nine. Graylin had been making the slow shuffle back towards her room, ready to grab her phone and leave, but that stopped her. She gripped the edge of the mantle tight, her hands shaking. She'd been ready to give up. She had been. What did you say? You know exactly what I said. Graylin began shaking uncontrollably. Her teeth clenched together. She tried desperately to keep herself calm, but it wasn't working. (sighs) She tried to breathe, but it hurt to... (sighs) How dare you? How dare you? How dare you? How dare me? Her mother reared on her, putting her strong hands on her and spinning her around like a beanpole. How dare me? See? Graylin stuttered through her fear. This is why Dad left. Her mother's eyes turned into fireballs, and she felt the hands leave her sides. Her mother's breathing was heavy and deep. Graylin began, but whatever it was, 
it was never said. The blow came suddenly like a thunderclap. For a second, Graylin saw her mother's hand in the air and began the instinctive flinch, but the blows usually came where no one could see them, her back, her chest, her sides. The slap hit her right on the side of the face. Not a light slap, but one with the weight of a punch. Her ear rang. Her cheek burned like it had been splashed with fire. She tried to right herself, but another slap hit the other cheek and she lost her footing. Then again... She couldn't feel her glasses anymore, they must have fallen off, and she couldn't hear what her mother yelled to the ringing in her ears. Just that there was yelling. She could barely see, everything looked so cloudy, and she realized that she wasn't standing up anymore. A foot hit her in the ribs, and she cried out, Mom, please! She managed to whimper, but the foot came again. Then there was nothing, and she felt a hand around her ponytail. For a second, she imagined Ashlyn had come to rescue her. But these were not those fingers, and they pulled her whole body up by her hair, the weight straining on her. She wobbled and managed to stand before another blow landed on her face. She rose again, hiding her own face with her hands. She held back her tears with years of practice. You will never... Talk to me like that again, young lady. Never! Graylin nodded. Look at me when I'm talking to you! She widened her fingers, so her right eye was looking at her, but not her left. That is the last outburst I will ever hear from you. You should be grateful I was this nice to you. You got lucky today, young lady. Graylin nodded again. Yes, I did. Good. You're an idiot. Her mother's face grew red, building up for the next explosion. I'm a what? <laughs> You're an idiot. Graylin turned her face away so she couldn't see the right half of it and pointed with her right hand at the mantel where her phone sat. Gently recording the whole event, she returned her hand to her face. You shouldn't touch it. It's already uploaded, backed up, Greeland said, somewhat louder. You... you... Her mother's temper seemed to ebb, rise, and fall, and then... Graylin, sweetheart... She wrapped her arms around her, pulling her hand-covered face against her shoulder. You know I didn't mean all that. I just get worked up sometimes. Maybe we can loosen some things, get you more pocket money so you don't have to work so much. You know I love you, right? I love you so much. She stroked the back of her head like a lion pawing at his gazelle carcass. We'll work something out. Mommy just doesn't want anything bad to happen to you. You know that, right? Graylin began to nod into her shoulder, like she always did. But then forced it out of her throat with all her courage, with all her strength, with everything she could ever find in herself, she made her mouth say a word. No. What did you say? I said no. I said no. I said no! She backed out of the hug, still hiding her face. I said no! 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 You don't know what you're saying. Just sit down. And she threw her hands out to her sides, freeing her face. I know what I said. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. You're not stopping me. I'm going into my room, getting Mr. Sprinkles and my books, and I'm walking out that door. And never coming back. And the next time you see me, I'll be in court getting an emancipation from you. I'm not your goddamn toy anymore. Her mother stood there stunned, then seemed to think of something to say. Look how strong you are. My baby girl is finally... I'm not hearing this! Stop it! Graylin made her way to the mantel and fumbled for her glasses on the floor. 
They were cracked in the left lens. She put them back on and grabbed her phone. She went into her room and shoved everything she cared about into a backpack and bag, then hugged Mr. Sprinkles and put him into his carrying case. She walked through the living room and out the door, keeping a dead stare at the exit, ignoring the other person in the house. Her face ached, her side ached, but the sunlight felt different on her skin. Either because she was free or because of the aching, she wasn't sure. She looked up at that light like it was something new. Happy birthday to me. Ashlyn and Marilyn sat in their matching linen squared t-shirts on the couch when the doorbell rang. Could you get that, Ashlyn? Her host mom yelled. Ashlyn made her way over to the door and opened it. There, with a bruised face, black eye, and cracked glasses, was Graylin Scythes. Hey, Graylin said. Hey, Ashlyn replied. I know this isn't a good time, but could I ask a favor of you? A voice came from upstairs. Who is it? Graylin, Ashlyn said. There were the loud stomps of feet coming down the stairs. You can tell that no good. Ashlyn's host mom, Petra, stopped as soon as she saw Graylin on the doorstep. Oh my god. I was just wondering if you could take in Mr. Sprinkles for a bit. I got kicked out of my mom's house. Petra ran towards the door and pulled Graylin in. What on earth happened to you? Graylin looked down at the floor and, setting the bag and the cat box down, covered her face. Petra hugged her and Graylin took her hands away from her face and returned the hug. Ashlyn, you go make some tea for our guest. Ashlyn nodded and ran off. Graylin couldn't make herself cry. She tried. She felt like if there was a time she would, it was now. She began to wonder if she'd forgotten how. Graylin's therapist had been called, who had called a lawyer, and they came over within the hour and talked to Graylin. The case was as solid as a brick wall. She'd get her emancipation, and the lawyer was fairly certain she could get her a private room in a Centro corporate housing building for free. It all sounded perfectly good. Marilyn and Ashlyn had both been really nice, if awkward, as had Petra. She'd expected them to send her away. She just thought it was worth the chance they could take the cat in. You're sleeping here. We have a spare futon in the basement, Petra ordered. Graylin shook her head. I can sleep on the floor in the lab. It's 24 hours, and there aren't that many people there at night. Petra looked at her, like what she was saying was not a normal thing to say. Graylin was confused. It's really not a problem. I'm sure we'd all like to have you here. I'm not so sure about that. Petra put a gentle hand on her shoulder. It felt warm in a way hands rarely did. Ashlyn and Marilyn are fine with it. I checked with my wife. She is, too. Graylin smiled. Thank you. She couldn't think of anything else to say. I don't actually know you guys very well. I don't want to be a burden. You're not. There should be more 15-year-olds around this house anyways. I'm 16, Graylin said. And let me tell you. It's been a weird birthday. And then the door exploded in, and you arrested me, Graylin said. Everyone was silent. The car bumped. That's quite the story, Alice said. Graylin couldn't read her. Was it really necessary to tell us about the dancing? I thought it was cheerful. Wasn't it cheerful? After something like that? Yeah, I, I suppose so. You sang the whole song, though. Did I... Sorry. Graylin put her hands on her lap. So you're not... Not really Director Scythes, the intern asked. But... You're still Graylin Scythes? 
from another universe. I'm an intern myself at the moment. Or was. So, what's the verdict, senorita? Believer? Manuel asked. Alice was impassive. We're almost at her stop, ma'am. Alice. Uh, yes, Alice. The vehicle pulled into a prison, where the doors were opened by a group of revolutionaries. Waiting outside the vehicle were more soldiers, and under careful watch, Archimedes. Arch! Graylin yelled, only to be shouted down by a soldier. They were ran out into the yard where Manuel was all smiles, and Arch stared at him. No one could see his expression. No one could tell he was staring as Songbird left the vehicle to cheer and a standing ovation. As the people clapped her on the shoulders and began singing the international. No, no one noticed his fist clenched as he stared at Manuel Salazar. No one realized the rage that was boiling inside him and how much it was going to take to bottle up. Hello, are you folks there? Arch ran up to the comm along with the other children who mobbed the common joy, each pressing the button to greet their only visitor. The door opened up after decontamination, and the masked children tackled the man in hugs. Salazar, said the governor of Honorabe Station from behind his mask, I'm very sorry for the improper greeting. Salazar smiled back in reply, It's no problem, no problem. None of them were used to him showing his face, and he looked embarrassed as he remembered and covered up his own with a mask from the wall mount. Sorry, I always forget. How is Earth? Salazar shook his head. Still a ruin. I've been working with the survivors to try to grow something outdoors, but the soil is so poisoned we cannot yet. Salazar sighed and wiped a tear from behind his mask. First station will be our salvation, I'm sure. And these children! It's future! He ruffled the top of one of the fully enclosed children. They were all, of course, encased. Everyone was, except those poor people on Earth. And there were only a handful of them left. When Salazar died, they would not ever get another visitor. Salazar looked down at the tiny arch, who, like the other children, was displaying a big red heart icon in his face. Do you trust me, children? They all exclaimed they did, and he opened a bag full of toys. They began to loot through. You can always trust me. Arch stared and stared until he was ushered to follow them into the building, but his fist stayed clenched and he muttered, Do you trust me?